Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and today I want to talk about the science of sound waves. Sound waves differ from electromagnetic waves in that they require a medium for the wave to travel through. In other words, the sun, the light from the sun gets here very quickly, but the sound from the sun simply can't travel through the vacuum of space. So to emphasize that, what I want to do is show you what the last scene of Star Wars would look like if they really followed the rules of science. So let me shrink my head, and let's watch. Now the reason why you wouldn't hear the Death Star exploding is that there's nothing for those sound waves or compressional waves to travel through. And so that's just one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about sound. First of all then, it's a mechanical wave, so it requires a medium to move through. If there's nothing there, the sound waves can't pass. Um, what is it traveling through right now? Well, my vocal cords are vibrating the air, which is vibrating the air molecules, vibrating the microphone, and it's picking up that sound. Um, if we're talking about water, can it move through water? For sure. In fact, it moves more quickly. Sound waves will travel quicker through water because it's more dense. If I were to hit down on a railroad track or a railroad tie, um, the, uh, the sound waves would travel very, very quickly through that because the steel is very, very dense. And so again, it's a mechanical wave and it's compressions that move through, through that. Next thing you should know is that it's a longitudinal wave. In other words, waves can move like this, we call those transverse waves, or it can move through this, uh, longitudinal waves. And so if I click the button and we watch the waves traveling, it's actually moving, or the disturbance is moving, in the direction of the wave. In other words, when I talk right now, if you could see the sound waves coming out of my voice, it would be a three-dimensional compressional wave that's moving out. But it's vibrating the air in the direction that it's actually moving. Next property is something called pitch. So when we hear sound, we talk about pitch. What is pitch? Well, pitch is really frequency. Frequency is how fast the waves are vibrating or oscillating. And so in science, we talk about frequency, but in sound or in music, we usually talk about pitch. What happens if I increase the frequency? I increase the pitch. Amplitude, or how big the waves are, is going to tell us the loudness of that wave. And, and both of these things are maybe a little easier to understand if we kind of play around with it. So this is a piece of software called ToneGen, and what I can essentially do is I can play a note. Um, so let me play a note. This is going to be a vibration at 261.6 hertz. So when I play that, what you're hearing is a a vibration of the sound waves, in this case it's coming from the speakers on your computer, um, it's vibrating the speakers at a rate of 261.6 per second. Now if I turn down the amplitude of those waves, you don't hear it anymore. In other words, when I make them waves or the compressions of the speaker smaller, you can't hear it. And so the amplitude of the wave, it refers to the loudness, let me turn it up again. But the frequency of the wave tells us uh, what the pitch is that we hear. And so we can increase the pitch. Well, let's quickly double that. So double 261.6 would be 523.3.2. And so now we would have a higher pitch. And so that's a note that is uh, twice the frequency of the wave we had before. And so instead of being middle C, this is a C that's up one octave. So let me stop that and let's go back to our middle C, which is not quite as annoying. And so we play that. And so this would be a sine wave, so it's a smooth oscillation of the wave. We also can have different waves that we can set up. So let's try a square wave. Sounds a little bit different. Or this would be a triangular wave. So the rate at which we change that can give us different sounds. This would be a sawtooth wave. And then this would be an impulse train. I don't even know what that is. Um, so what's the most pleasing? Well, let's go back to the sine wave. Sine wave is going to be just a smooth oscillation of your speaker back and forth. Um, and we can just increase the pitch now. So if we take that pitch and increase it, So what are we doing? We're simply making the speaker move in more and more quickly and then uh, we're hearing that sound. Now why do you sound good when you sing in the shower? The reason you sound good when you're singing in the shower is that waves have a specific wavelength and each 
each frequency is going to cause a different wavelength. As I increase my frequency, I'm going to decrease my wavelength. So the wave length, the length gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So these would be higher pitch and shorter wavelength. These would be lower pitch and longer wavelength. But if you can get the waves to fit perfectly into the container that they're uh, sitting in, they create a harmonic or a resonance. And so when you sing in a shower, this is Ferris Bueller, the sound waves are fitting perfectly within that shower. And that's why you sound much better when you're singing in the shower. It's because the waves fit perfectly. It also explains why you could have the perfect pitch, and if we increase that uh, amplitude, we could shatter a wine glass if we have the waves fitting perfectly inside that uh, wine glass. So how do we actually perceive, or in other words, how does our ear work? Well, we have to take a look at it. So this part of your ear, the outer ear, is just funneling the sound down the auditory canal until you eventually have a eardrum, which is going to be on the inside. We take the vibrations right now as we vibrate this uh, window right here, your eardrum, it's connected to a series of bones that connect to an oval window that sits here on this uh, structure called the cochlea. It's on the inside of your ear. Why do we go from a really big window to a small window here? We get amplification. And also we're getting leverage uh, through these simple machines that connect to that oval window. And so we're actually taking small vibrations here and making very big vibrations on the inside of your cochlea. Now how does your cochlea actually work? Well, let me take this part of the cochlea and if we were to stretch it out, it would look like this. And so what do we have? Well, what we really have are a series of really, really big, I mean, in scale, showers, and really, really small showers. And so all along the cochlea, the air, or the fluid in there, is going to resonate at a specific frequency. And so when you hear really high pitches, that's going to be in the really narrow part of your cochlea, and low pitches are going to be on the really low end. And so there are going to be frequencies that you can't, can't hear. In other words, really low frequency sounds that you can't pick up, and the reason why is that your cochlea isn't big enough. If we were to look in a whale cochlea, it's going to be really, really big. And so they can hear very, very low frequency sounds that travel really good in far distances through the water. Um, and so what is the limit? Well, most, most literature says that we can hear pitches on the low end at 20 hertz and at a high end of 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. And you know this if you're a teenager because you're probably familiar with uh, mosquito ringtones. And so how does that work? Well, if I play a note like this, this would be 9 kilohertz or this is going to be 9,000 hertz. You can hear that and I can hear that. But if we increase that to 10 kilohertz or 11 kilohertz or 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, right there, I can't hear it anymore, that sound. But if you're younger than me, you probably can. Or can you hear it at 16 or 17 hertz or 18 hertz? Can you hear it at 19 hertz, 20 hertz? I can't hear that at all. And it probably has a, a, a lot to do with the amount of rock and roll music I listened to when I was younger. Um, in other words, my limit is much, much smaller that I can hear. So I can't hear a lot on the low end or the high end. And that's just because I'm getting older. And these nerves and the hairs that actually pick that up in my ear are, are, are dropping off as well. So that's the uh, frequency or the pitch. And so we can hear a broad range, but it's based on this structure right here. And you can see that different parts of our cochlea are actually able to pick up different frequencies. But the other thing is how loud a sound is. And sound uh, is, that's not so much the frequency but it's how big they are. And so we measure that in something called a decibel. And so a decibel goes from zero, which would be the lowest end. In other words, I could just perceive that as a sound or a vibration, all the way up to 130 decibels, which is pain actually comes from that. And this is a logarithmic scale. In other words, this would be one decibel we could think of, but 130 decibels would be 10 trillion times as much. In other words, one with 13 zeros after it. And so we can hear a really broad range, and we can hear a really broad range of frequencies as well. And, and that's all thanks to the uh, amplification of our ear and the wonderful cochlea. So I hope that that makes a little bit more sense, uh, and thanks for listening.